Good evening. Uh, welcome to this public program. Professor Anindya Sinha's wide-ranging research interests are in the areas of behavioral ecology and cognitive psychology of primates, animal molecular genetics, evolutionary biology, conservation biology, and the philosophy of biology. Uh, his most significant research contribution was in the discovery of a new species of primate, the Arnachal Maka, in northeastern India. Although the, although principal contributions have been in understanding the structure and evolution of the primate mind. In addition to this, I think he is the best person at NIAS to chair this session because of his film uh, connection with films. He is the son of uh, director, uh, late director Tapash Sina, the noted and famous Bengali director. So without much ado, can I request Professor Anindya Sina to kindly chair this session and introduce the speaker. Thank you. Um. Thank you, Chidambaran, for that introduction. And yes, I have often been mentioned by my illustrious father, uh, though, of course, uh, I'm not sure that's necessarily a good thing because I think he personally was a little disappointed when I told him that I wanted to study monkeys all my life. But, uh, but then, that's life. <laughs> but anyway, it's a great pleasure and an honor to welcome uh, Sri Bharadwaj Jarangan, uh, who's our speaker today. Uh, just a few words about him. I'm sure all of you have read him, but uh, he's an Indian film critic, writer, and the deputy editor of The Hindu. He won the National Film Award for Best Film Critic in 2006. Before joining The Hindu, Mr. Rangan wrote for The New Indian Express. <clears throat> he had no formal training in filmmaking or cinema writing, which means there's still hope for us. He is a chemical engineering graduate <clears throat> from the Birla Institute of Technology and Science, Pilani. And according to him, it was a time when, and I quote this, parents considered only medicine or engineering as serious professions, in which he did not have any interest, but continued with it anyway. Sri Rangan claims that he was fascinated with the writing and loved reading critical analyses of world cinema, especially by American critics. He was selected for a workshop by the Advertising Agencies Association of India, which led him having a stint as a copywriter with J. Walter Thompson in Chennai. After that, he received a full scholarship from the Marquardt University in Milwaukee in the US for a master's degree in advertising and public relations, focusing on internet advertising. He later worked as an IT consultant in the United States for about five years, but then he still had the urge to write and started reviewing films for a particular website, sitagita.com. He was soon selected by Ms. Sushila Ravindranath, then editor of the New Sunday Express, and began to work there for two years before shifting to the Hindu, for which, as I mentioned earlier, he became the deputy editor. He also wrote for the magazine Tehelka while still working for the New Indian Express. Sri Rangan has authored two books, <clears throat> Conversations with Mani Ratnam in 2012, wherein he interviews Mr. Ratnam on his perspectives on cinema, and his second book is The Dispatches from the Wall Corner, a journey through Indian cinema, which was published in 2014, in which he describes as a, quote, pan panoramic view of Indian cinema, unquote. He also wrote an essay in Subramaniapuram, the Tamil film in English translation in 2014. He made his debut as a dialogue writer with Kadal II, Kalyanam, which unfortunately never saw a theatrical release. He also teaches a course on cinema at the Asian College of Journalism in Chennai and has interviewed a number of notable personalities in the course of his career. Uh, again, may I just mention that he also won the Best Film Critics Award in 2006 at the 53rd National Film Awards. Great pleasure and honor to have you here. Uh, first of all, my apologies for the delay in the start of this presentation. Uh, uh, the flight just took off late and the dog ate my homework, so all that happened. So i um, really sorry about that. I you know, hope you didn't have to wait for too long. Secondly, um, I was a little alarmed when uh, I was told that had I not arrived on time, the gentleman who just spoke before me would have had to have uh, conducted a session and, um, and you might have had a very different kind of session with, with probably a much more interesting session on primate minds. So, and, and thirdly, I, I, I was really touched that uh, uh, to have such an exhaustive uh, introduction. Uh, usually when, when people introduce uh, speakers, there's a very cursory kind of uh, 
uh, introduction uh, rounds, but this was really quite exhaustive, and I'm touched that you took the trouble to uh, to kind of put together something like this. Um, cinema and social change is is one of those topics that that gets my blood boiling <laughs> because I, I just don't know if if the two should even coexist uh, in the same uh, kind of um, you know in the same phrase. But uh, let's do one thing, uh, if, if, if everyone's okay with it, or at least if some of you are okay with this. Instead of this just being a one-way talk, I thought maybe this being the last session of this week, maybe we could have an interactive session. Would that be okay with some of you? Would that be okay? Okay. So, um, so the, the, one of, the, one of the, the first things I wanted to talk about is the fact that, can everyone hear me? Yeah is the fact that cinema as an art form is just about 100 years old. Now before this, you've had art obviously, you've had, um, there's, there's music has been around forever, there's been dance, there's been sculpture, there's been poetry, you've had writing of different kinds and then most notably in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, the novel, you've had the novel. You've had drama, you've had plays, You've had theater, you've had painting, and then um, just before cinema, you started having photography. Now, why don't we have sessions that say photography and social change, or sculpture and social change, or uh, painting or poetry and social change? It's almost always cinema that, that kind of gets clubbed in with this idea of, of social change, if, if you've noticed, has any one of you heard of any of the other arts um, allied with the phrase social change? Anyone has? There's one gentleman has heard something there. No, 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 I'm not talking about of interest. I'm talking about, do people talk about it as, you know, of, 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 of do, do they club this together and talk about this? Like, do you have people presenting things on photography and social change or? Literature. Literature. But, so that's one thing that, that probably is the only thing that when you talk about, especially the novel, is you're talking about uh, the novel. And now you have cinema being talked about as social change. So, so let's first talk about Social responsibility is is something is cinema or even art. Let's okay. Let's not talk about art in general or literature as an extension of cinema because cinema kind of encompasses all these arts. Right? There's a bit of photography in it. There's a bit of literature in it. There's a bit of all kinds of elements in it. So, so um, we're not talking about journalism though. We're only talk, We're not talking about that kind of uh, you know where where it's a more direct kind of communication. We're talking about a more artistic way of expression or a slightly more aesthetic way of ex expression. That's what we're talking about in cinema. For instance, um, so let's, let's, let's not talk about social change yet. Let's just talk about social responsibility first. Now, you've had, is this, is, I mean, I'm very interested in the question of, is there a burden on cinema, placed on cinema, that is not placed on other arts? This burden of being socially responsible, this burden of being socially acceptable through the mediation of a censor board that decides what a society can and cannot see. You don't, sorry, yeah. Not the industry. I'm talking about otherwise, because otherwise we wouldn't be talking about this session, right? So, so maybe the word burden may be too heavy a word. Let's say social responsibility is what I was going after. Who's going in their own way? Yeah, <laughs> but that's part of the thing, right? Yeah, yeah. The out right. Yeah, so what I'm also going for is, I just wanted to first say, I mean, I was going to come to that. So I was going to say that 
isn't it up to the individual to decide, or, or rather, to, uh, isn't it an individual's uh, uh, thing, isn't it an individual thing of whether or not how somebody reacts to any kind of art, and not some kind of, you know, a, a mass influence thing. But as, as someone said here, there are many reasons cinema is often um, comes in the forefront of this whole thing called social change, why people keep talking about cinema and social change, because one is it's a very pervasive medium. It's everywhere. Everyone has access to it. It's not like literature where only the educated people um, you know, have access to it. And it's not even like, and, and especially the kind of novels that you talk about are, are read by fewer people. So it's not like literature where, where uh, it's not like poetry, it's not like any other art. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, probably the only other art form that, that has this kind of reach is music. Uh, in terms of being, a, you know, in terms of its ability of being broadcast to a large number of people at the same time. But again, uh, you know, we, we're talking about, so one is the, the pervasiveness of the medium. Everybody has access to it. Everyone from every class has access to it. You don't have to be particularly educated to, to uh, go and watch a movie. You don't have to, you, you, everyone, whether you're, you know, you don't have, you can be rich, you're poor, or, you know, you could have gone to school, you've not gone to school. Everyone ca has access to uh, uh, films. The other thing is, it's very powerful. It's very immersive. Again, compared to literature, you can take a book and then you read 50 pages, you can keep the book and then you can go out and you can come back and, and you can continue reading the book a little later, right? And that's how most of us read books. Nobody, I mean, very few of us read 600 pages all at one go. But with films, even if it's, it's whether it's two or two and a half or three hours, we have an immersive experience at one stretch. And I'm not talking about those of you, I mean, I'm not talking about watching it at home or on DVD or something that I'm like, for the sake of this talk, it's an, let's talk about the most ideal situation of watching a film in a, a cinema theater. So we are trapped, we are, we are being projected images that are hugely impactful because of the size of the image, the scope of the image, the, the sound that comes at us, the light, everything that's been pre-decided to produce a certain emotional reaction in us. Again, most, most mainstream cinema is like that, right? I mean, it's calculated to produce some kind of uh, response. Uh, it could be, uh, sometimes it's an emotional response. If it's a slightly non-mainstream film, it could be a, an intellectual response or whatever it is. But the, whole, the way the whole the script has been structured, the way the performances have been directed, everything comes together to produce a very powerful impact in us. So the first point is it's very pervasive. The second point is very powerful. And, and when, the other thing is that Almost 90% of films today are, even if they're not realistic, they're set in real surroundings. So we, we, we don't have that kind of barrier stepping into the world of these films as say we would have in a mythological movie or in a historical movie because when we see that setting, we immediately switch off and say, oh, this was another time, it doesn't apply to us. But when we see things happening to people like us, but on screen, immediately there's a bit of a blurring of the line. We feel that maybe this could be us. This, 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 there's an extension of us. So there's a blurring of the lines and this could be us. So there's another thing about that cinema just blurs into society that way because it is in a way a reflection of society, however stylized it is, however exaggerated it is. Did I see someone raising a hand there? No. no. So, then the other thing is, um, I think you raised this point, because of the popularity of cinema, because of the pervasiveness of cinema, it, it, it is often an easy, for the lack of a better word, target. Because if, let's talk about banning for instance, right? If you want to go and ban a book, not many people are going to hear about it, not many people are going to get affected about it, not many people are going to report it. Or even if you look at the way me, the, the, the newspapers and other media functions today, uh, if a poem is banned, it would be on um, you know, page eight or something like that. But if, if a film is banned, especially if it's a film of, uh, with a big star, it becomes front page news. So you know, 
the the people behind the ban who are who have who are in this to get some kind of visibility for themselves they prefer to uh, to uh, uh, to target cinema rather than other mediums because it is a very popular medium and it is a very uh, people are interested in what what keeps happening though it's not just here it's the world over the other thing is compression again the literature example is best if you if you let's if you talk about the great social novels of upheaval like um, like say uh, les miserables or if you talk about uh, the brothers karamazov or something you, know, you you have great and deep themes developed over let's say a thousand pages so it's a it's a big fat book that talks about big fat topics right but all this is woven into a narrative that seemingly is about people with themes running in the undercurrent and i'm talking i'm there are novels that do this more didactically of course but i'm talking about the general novel right whereas in a movie there's a huge amount of stuff is compressed so there's a pressure to within 2 hours to hit all the main points of what's happening so sometimes the main points become the most socially relevant points so that kind of makes you say that this movie is not about this family but this movie is about this problem that tari zameen par is not the story of a boy and his mother and whatever it is but it is about dyslexia because the minute that that you know you look in I mean because it's a highly compressed version of it you don't have much time to kind of you know wait for 100 pages before you kind of jump into the whole thing you know so and, and the way films are promoted advertised everything becomes um uh, uh everything that that's another that's another reason and the other thing is tradition because indian films started off as does anybody know what what were the earliest indian films yeah but what 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 genre were they mythological so the earliest indian films were mythological then for the longest time they were mythological films but slowly around the, the you know people started incorporating more social themes into the into the uh into the uh, movies and uh, you know by 1939 uh, you had uh, in tamil for instance you had um, uh, this uh, a movie called uh, tyagabhumi which was uh, which which strongly upheld gandhian ideals because it was a new medium and uh, people were going in, uh, in droves to see this see these movies and it was a, a very effective propaganda tool so so people realized that pe- the, the, these masses that were coming in to see the the adventures of krishna and rama and prahlad and all these other uh, uh, mythological uh, entities if you know if you if you give them a similar i mean a very different kind of reality they discovered they were coming for that too it was also because of the newness of the medium because people were going to see the content of course but also the form was new right because you have this this amazing thing that's showing you a kind of reality uh, out there on a, on a, on a screen and it's it's uh, by 1939 we're talking about a medium that's that's just about 30 to 40 years old so that's it's a hardly developed medium and, and you have a huge tradition of that where shantaram was making his uh, aadmi and padosi and all these movies which are about social themes and um, uh, in the 50s you have raj kapoor making a series of films about uh, you know like in the 50s 40s 50s 60s i'm talking about you know you where you have films talking about the reformation of dacoits in the jis desh mein ganga behti hai you have films like shreef 420 which talks about uh, you know how we shouldn't take the shortcut in life and how we should be ready to work hard for uh, results we have films like avara which talks about nature versus nurture we have do bigas i mean bimal roy the whole uh, the kind of neuralistic movement and uh, in tamil again we have this uh, uh, we have the political parties like the dmk and and the uh, the writers from the dmk like anadura and karnanidhi coming in uh, <clears throat> uh, using uh, you know using this medium to uh, uh, you know to to uh, as a propaganda tool for their ideas like this movie called velekari which means servant girl is a is a um, or today to be more politically correct i suppose you'd say domestic help but uh, the, the 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 it is about class conflicts and how uh, what kind of uh, injustice <clears throat> what kind of uh, 
uh, how the rich treat the poor and, and how the poor retaliate. So it's a kind of a, it's almost like a communist uh, manifesto kind of thing. So you have a new medium, a new audience, and a pliant audience, and, and, and a nation that is still being molded. So for a while, you, you, you have people who are hopeful, they're not cynical, and they're watching all these things because it's partly because it's there to watch, there's nothing else to do, right? I mean, it's there to watch, but partly also because, you know, there's all this hope and there's all this wonderful thing about, you know, the new country, their new ideals, people are idealistic, and then slowly that starts slipping. And you have, by the 60s, once cinema turns into color, you have all the whole, the neorealistic movement, the whole, you know, the whole uh, Raj Kapoor type of film, which is not exactly an art film, but also, uh, you know, it's a commercial film with songs and dance and big heroines and all that, but, but, but about very serious uh, social themes. Now that happens, goes away, and suddenly you have Shami Kapoor going and jumping, in, jumping around in Shimla and, and all these places. Why is that? Because suddenly escapism and entertainment, once people got a wind of that, that started becoming a bigger priority to movie goals, which is not to say that in the 60s other kinds of movies are not being made because you still have Bimal Roy making his kinds of movies and all that. But <clears throat> the, the shift slowly started, uh, the, the gap slowly started widening between the movies that people wanted to see versus the, people, the movies that socially responsible filmmakers wanted to make. And by the 70s, the gap had widened to such a degree that the movies that people wanted to see became the mainstream films. And the movies that socially responsible people wanted to make got clubbed under this category called parallel cinema. So what was mainstream cinema in the... Of course, there's a huge difference in form between what a Raj Kapoor did and a, a, a Benegal or a Nehlani did. So there's, there's a huge difference in form. But I'm talking about theme. We're talking about being socially responsible within a cinematic framework. You have what was mainstream in the 50s and 40s, by the 70s has become a niche uh, uh, subset of cinema called parallel cinema, which is supposedly for the intelligentsia and things like that. So, so we have a before and after uh, phase of social responsible cinema. Now, any thoughts on what we've talked about so far? Sorry? That's what I'm coming to. So that's part of it. It is part of market dynamics because, um, I was going to come to this later, but since you raised this point, so apart from this, the cynicism in, in, it's in all of us today, right? It's, it's, it's there. What do you think reduced the number of films like those films. What, what, what do you think reduced the number of social responsible films, films that concerned themselves with changing society and versus films that were just entertaining for other purposes? I'm not saying that those are not important. I'm just saying that what, what do you, can anyone say, give a, sorry? One, one at a time, please. Sorry? Okay. Okay. The audience wants entertainment. Okay. But what makes you think an entertaining film cannot be artistic? It can be, but then the, uh, the divide becomes, became uh, so wide that one was almost mutually exclusive to the other. It, it, it could have been many, but it didn't. Okay. A different uh, view on that. Okay. <coughs> the, Cinema is, after all, the reflection of society. Okay. In society, we want the shortcut. We want to be... So what if uh, we say all those ahimsa and good thing and all that, people just reject it. This is, this is only... They, they want, if somebody beats me, I have to beat him. So these are the kind that took root. Uh, and uh, that uh, later on when the pole violence, the this, that and all that, these are going on. I mean, cinema cannot remain away from that. So they wanted to show that. The people did not want to see this. See, 
Uh, if somebody wants to become sajjan, let him be sajjan. But uh, that's like that. Yeah, so that is, that is part of what I was saying is, is that, you know, earlier on people were, I mean, I'm not suggesting they were saints, but there was more goodness in people, I guess there was more hope in people, there was more of a tolerance in people. We were still talking about Gandhi's influence being prevalent throughout the country. Whereas slowly, as after independence, 10 years happened, 20 years happened, by the 70s, we were suddenly looking at a very different kind of social scenario. And uh, all the hope from then had kind of curdled into a different kind of uh, emotion. And, and you know, the films reflected that. Somebody. Yeah. You see, when you're saying that these films initially were on a social cause. Not all of them, but yes. Many of them. Yeah. And the public was going and watching them. I was surprised that the state, which was running enterprise, public sector undertakings, why did the state not venture into filmmaking and sell the ideas of nationalism or unity or things like that which the public could buy and then the state would have realized in the 70s that now the public wants to see different things which we are not that's not our charter i mean i didn't see the state involving themselves in films right the, the, in, other the, than small documentaries here and there right so the thing is um, except for a few countries like russia which has a which had a very committed state sponsored film movement uh, throughout the world filmmaking has remained a private enterprise this is, I don't know, maybe because they just thought of it as art and therefore, you know, art is left to the artist. I think that's one of the things because, uh, like you said, it could be a very, in Russia, it was a very, very effective propaganda tool. And in Nazi Germany, again, uh, the Weimar Germany, the, again, films were used as a very, very effective propaganda tool to uh, propagate what the state wanted to think. So uh, that was not there in uh, many, many other countries. So I think the... Uh, yeah, but what happened later on was a state-sponsored agency uh, called the NFDC, the National Film Development Corporation, came up a little later. And um, most of us who've been to the theaters in the 70s or the 80s have suffered through some of the documentaries uh, about, uh, you know, well-intentioned but very, very poorly made, uh, you know, those five-minute documentaries that, that were shown before the... Uh, the Films Division documentaries, but there are amazing documentaries that were made by the same Films Division of greater length and by very, very good filmmakers that uh, unfortunately nobody, uh, mainly because people didn't have access to them and also because these short, uh, clumsily put together films turned people off the very word documentary, you know. So they kind of did not even feel like, even today when you ask somebody, you know, in India, typically there's the culture of watching documentaries is, is very, very non-existent. It's practically, it's only like, you know, like film buffs or people like that will seek them out. So, so, so yeah, so then the NFDC started sponsoring some, uh, they, they would give uh, funding to people who they thought were making worthy films. So the pr filmmaker would submit a proposal and, you know, typically films about farmers and, and the feudal type, like Ankur, for instance, you know, it's about feudalism in a village and all these kinds of films, though that was a private film. What I'm trying to say is those kinds of films uh, gradually started uh, coming out of NFDC, though that also became uh, a problem because, again, this is something that I was going to get to later, that, uh, that after a point, the, the NFDC became associated with only a certain kind of film. And uh, that's what happened with the state-sponsored thing, so. Yeah. Is the divide between parallel cinema and entertainment, uh, entertaining movies, slowly uh, sort of mixing up now and not, there's no such clear divide? That is one uh, question. And the other is, what makes music such an integral part of uh, uh, cinema? be it parallel movies or entertainment in Indian cinema vis-a-vis -vis anywhere across the world. So, so can we come back to these two questions at the end? Uh, because they're slightly, uh, I mean, will you ask me these questions at the end? So that, yeah. You had something to mm -hmm. There is a reason uh, why there is a shift. Uh, I mean, not one reason, some few reasons are there. In 60s, uh, uh, the government policies are not reaching up to the uh, poor. Uh, that is the way, through cinema, the morals or whatever that uh, mean exploitation by the rich, by, I mean rich to the poor, that used to attract the attention of the audience. 
in 70s the governance could able to manage all those social evils that whatever you say social responsibilities so that's how uh, government has uh, completed the uh, duty of cinemas to the some extent that is one reason second reason I, is I, I didn't get that government has government policies see exploitation has been uh, reduced or eliminated in the 70s yeah in 60s and 70s the policies were so uh, that uh, like so many rules were introduced into the parliament that uh, child labor you call it a uh, child marriage oh, like that. Okay. yeah so many mean policies were going to the mean roots so that's why the awareness has gone up and uh, cinema need not do that work because already government has done to some extent that is first reason second reason is any you see human uh, i mean emotion that's what you said uh, with one uh, documentary or you call uh, only it carries one emotion only and uh, recently it was asked uh, why can't you make a film on traffic sense you see uh, now in india traffic sense is very very poor but it was asked to uh, the producers uh, why can't you make movie on traffic sense he said i cannot continue more than 10 to 15 minutes yeah i cannot stretch more than 10 to 15 minutes two and a half hours i cannot make on that uh, issue i have to mix so many uh, morals uh, that becomes a kitchen so people don't accept it so that's how now the new movies are become entertaining in nature because morality already everybody knows still they violate so through um, movies it is difficult to continue for two hours that is uh, the reason why there is a shift in uh, movie making i think i think what you're saying is uh, i think I, i disagree slightly with one aspect because the fact that there are policies or rules in place does not mean that there is an awareness of those uh, of those policies or rules so for instance like you said child labor right you know it's, there are rules in place but you know even today you find so many uh, how, so the point is whether cinema has a social responsibility to to tell stories in in this medium that will raise some kind of awareness and cause some kind of change i think that's what we are we're trying to uh, discuss here right isn't that what we're trying to do here so uh, the 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 fact that yes the government keeps uh you know putting all this new we get the news about all these things new acts and new this and new that but whether uh you know because for that for that matter we're still talking about uh, dalit issues today despite the fact of so many uh, acts uh, being put into place right so and and this year we had uh, like two films like we not this year we had just now we had a, a hindi film called chauranga which came out just maybe a, a week or two ago which was about exactly this about the dalit youth who's uh, uh, you know who's uh, who finds that uh, who's oppressed in his village and what happens to him so this is very sorry yeah my people is that in 60s early 70s the initial euphoria of uh, independence died away right uh, and a kind of anger Uh, you know because what people had expected will happen in two decades after independence did not materialize right It's only in 1974 that first time we became we stopped importing something as basic as food grains you know so uh, movie took the shape of a escape uh, 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 medium rather than a career of hope and other thing and that's where the digression from a message carrying medium to an entertainment uh, medium that's that's my interpretation that's definitely part of it yes yeah related to what uh, has been spoken now we were living in the uh, euphoria of getting independence we were very happy about it and slowly and suddenly it started fading wherein we started losing our idols also we were in search of idols awareness was increasing what he has said we were looking to vent it out or we were looking or trying to identify somebody coming out with similar kind of problems that is where the shift that romance of independence has started fading in the 60s with the demise of all the prominent leaders and then we'll in search of certain better idols right that's also part of the thing so where i was going with this is um there was first of all after a point we're talking about the logistics of cinema so we're talking about the lack of avenues 
to display, uh, to, to, uh, uh, to show these films. So uh, in the 70s and uh, in the, even till the, till the early 80s, you, you still had the odd theater showing your parallel film, which is about a socially relevant theme, which could you know, cause some kind of social change or something like that. But after that, these avenues vanished. And uh, until the multiplexes started coming, that, that kind of film, it became impossible for a distributor or a filmmaker to, to kind of get that kind of film across. That's why you found, uh, after a point, a lot of these films would come directly to, uh, to TV as a, uh, as a telefilm. You know, all these major filmmakers started making television films because they found that it was impossible to, uh, to make these films viable uh, as commercial films. Now, why these avenues dried up? Because I think uh, a film with a social message, uh, uh, you know, everybody cannot appreciate it because you watch a movie and then comes with a burden on your head. On the other hand, like, entertainment movies, you know, it's very light. They can be appreciated by, by mass masses. So that was the, and anyway, market drives. So that was the main reason for this shift. Definitely, that's, that's definitely there. So I was the, one of the reasons for the for the, the vanishing of the avenues is the advent of home viewing uh, options. So once you have your you know people saying that why should I go to the theater and watch a movie when I can wait for a bit and watch it at home, the 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 the, the filmmakers for whom the theatrical uh, revenue is the major source of income for them, they start making movies that will attract the maximum number of people. So if you go and watch a socially relevant film, they will make a socially relevant film because it's not that they don't want to make it. There are many people who want to make these films, but they also have to be commercially viable. So unless those films find an audience, they are not going to make movies for people who are going to sit at home and watch it on DVD or download it on a uh, thing or wait for three months and watch it on YouTube. They're going to watch, make movies for people who watch, go to the theaters and feed that whole system of films and popcorn and soda and all these kinds of things because that entire ecosystem is fed by cinema. So if you don't, if, if the films that, that feed that, that system are the films that get made. It's, very, it's as simple as that. So... That's again a different thing, right? I mean, we will come back to that question because I'm talking only about why the the, the, the social change of films. It's not, you know, so, so, uh, so, uh, so. The, uh, I would like to just put my one opinion. Right. Uh, in my opinion, the <clears throat> this important media <clears throat> of cinema <clears throat> misused by a group of persons, keeping public to divert from creative thinking by giving masala films which which are more eye catching and mind blocking i'm a fan of masala films yeah so don't tell me so i i can't keep watching important films all the time i'll go mad so i need my dose of entertainment every now and then so don't uh, so the point is not that that you know the eye catching stuff we all want i mean who you know who doesn't like it it's it's the point is that it shouldn't be ridiculous you know, there should be some kind of internal logic to even those kinds of films. But, uh, so anyway, coming back to what I was saying, so once, if you, if people go and say, or vote with their money for a certain kind of film, then that kind of film will get made. So if the, if the reason social, socially relevant films are not getting made, it's simply because there are not that many people going and watching those kinds of films. So, and coming back, I'm not, I'm not saying that uh, there's a very, so that is from the filmmaker's point of view. And from the w film watcher's point of view, like somebody here br brought up that point, film watching has become very expensive. So if you go with a family of four and you, you, you go um, you know, to, to a theater and you, there's a certain uh, you know, amount of money that you blow up, thousand bucks, two thousand bucks, whatever it is, that's expensive. So uh, you find increasingly that people are saying, that if I'm going to the theater to watch a movie, I'm going to watch the big Salman or Shah Rukh movie where you know, I'll get a lot of bang for my buck, so to speak, with the family, rather than go and watch a movie in which 
which is about a farmer or a, you know like about a teacher or about a something else so it is not that that uh, the the it, so that that is also fed into this thing that the people are saying that the, the biggest blockbusters today are all entertainers in some way i'm i'm saying they're not necessarily uh, masala movies but they're all uh, they all offer some kind of reason for the person to go to the theater like if if you go to a bajira mastani there's a the person can say okay i'm getting spectacle if you go to a, a bajrangi bhajan then the people are saying that i'm going to get this you know so there's there's some kind of thing that they go they get involved with something they they, they spend 3 hours and they come back and if you notice there are a lot of people who st who today who say things like they will not watch uh, uh, a sad movie or a, when, what they call by a sad movie is anything that that has some kind of tragedy or has a has a sobering theme or something like that simply because i already lead such a you know a difficult life i i i have all these problems in office my manager keeps shouting at me my something happens my wife keeps yelling at me and on top of all this i'm going to the theater i want two and a half hours of entertainment i'm spending all this money and going there i want two and a two and a half hours of entertainment if you want social change you keep it to yourself so that's another that's another reason so, so the, the movies aren't, aren't just what the filmmakers want to give us it's also what we choose or we ask them to do by buying tickets for certain kinds of films if we don't buy tickets for certain kinds of films they're not going to make those movies so that's also part of the the whole equation which sometimes we forget that if if everyone wanted a certain kind of film they would go watch those films and filmmakers would make those kinds of films because they know that there is an audience for that kind of film and the other reason is also um the the nri uh, factor that came up in the 90s that that encouraged a certain kind of i don't know if regressive is the word for it but traditional is certainly um, there are a certain kind of traditional indian value kind of film where even today you know uh, where i mean i think they 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 long for an india that no longer exists that exists only in their imagination when the homes that they grew up in and things like that so you know they want to see that india again but in a in a glitzy form they want to see these big joint families living together they want to see you know people wearing all these lovely clothes for these festivals and celebrating all these festivals and falling at elders feet and and you know praying to god and doing all these things that that kind of no longer happens because you're all in nuclear families and running about at the computer everywhere so that also you know contributed to a certain kind of film that's being made so you know when you're talking about cinema and social change i certainly uh, want to emphasize the word social because society is definitely a driver of the kind of cinema that's made at any point in time so that's that's the other point that i wanted to make which is why no which is why you have this what used to be relatively uh in the parallel cinema time what used to be uh uh, uh a starker form of storytelling a more honest if you want or pure if you want kind of storytelling around these issues has today been co-opted in a more glitzy mainstream format where we we mean this phenomenon everywhere is known as sugar coating so you kind of uh you take uh, tare zameen par even if you don't i mean you, you you have an amir khan to attract you to the theater so if the same movie had had uh, it would be a very interesting study that somebody did if a very similar movie was made but with a, another kind of uh, a, a different kind of actor let's say a nawazuddin siddiqui or somebody like that would would he, that many people go and watch that movie somebody saying yes okay cool with that with kind of that kind of numbers with those kinds of numbers ha huh? justify the success of a masan it is not a success i'm talking about commercial success i'm not talking about artistic success no see you're talking i'm talking about a, a movie that 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 has a serious theme a masan is a fantastic film right talwar talwar is a success i'm not but all these are niche multiplex successes you're talking about successes talwar for instance made about against all it made some some 30 crores or something like that all over india hmm? 
No, but that you're also talking about reach, right? If you if you're talking about social change, you 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 don't want just uh, like like a handful of people in the in in places where the tickets cost 300 500 bucks to come and see the movie and give you that kind of return. You want your single screens to watch that movie, right? That's uh, that where the ticket cost is 50 bucks and 100 bucks and if that, those numbers come to you then that's there's some kind of uh, I'm not I'm not saying that Masan is not a success or that uh, Talwar is not a success. I'm just talking about the scale of the success of for the, for a film of, with this kind of theme. So so you have more glitzy packaging where people kind of take the, the I mean, they come in to see a sugar-coated bitter pill, but the, they kind of chew on the sugar and pretty much ignore the pill. And one of the reasons for this is, is, um, is that, is that, uh, you just have to forgive me for a second. One of the, one of the reasons for this is that it's a, uh, it's it's a question of most of if you notice um, where are most serious issues discussed? That is what I'm saying. I'm not denying that there is an audience for Masan at all. The very fact that a film like Masan can get a theatrical release today, even in, uh, like in, in about five, I mean about let's say ten cities across India, is an amazing thing. It's not. I'm not discounting that at all. I'm talking about a certain scale, but you cannot. So this, the point that I'm trying to make now is that when you talk about films like Masan, your see, this is what I like. I call the op-ed phenomenon, which is you in the newspapers, for instance. You have op-ed writers, the the center page, the edit page, the op-ed uh, op, op page, where you have long articles about and opinions about serious issues. The people who read these issues are 90% of them people who have already bought into these issues, who are already convinced about the importance of these issues, who are already, you will find very few who read them in order to change what the, the, they think about an issue. So what I'm trying to say is this whole question of preaching to the converted. So um, uh, when a movie like Charanga comes out or a movie like Masan comes out, it is seen mostly by people who already know that these things are bad. Who already, so they're looking at it from a cinematic perspective and they no doubt are looking at it as a social thing. But when you're talking about social change, that is not going to come from the band of viewers that sees Masan or a Talwar because they've already subscribed to the, the whatever the movie is selling. Social change can happen only if the people to, in, the, in the villages where uh, all these practices are prevalent or, or, or whichever issue you're talking about, it, when those people see the movies and are uh, going to be influenced. Again, does the movie have the power to cause that kind of thing? That's a different kind of study. But I'm talking about the, the, the nature of the distribution itself right now. So unless we can establish a way that, that, that the people who really need to see this movie are going to watch that movie, as opposed to the people who have already bought into whatever this movie is saying, we really don't know about this whole uh, cinema social change thing. Yeah, sure. Sorry. I feel whether there is a need for you know, that of a stick and box or life box. We all went and swiped because of the flavor. It gave us a new idea. Right. But did it cause a social change in my mentality? Yeah. So that I changed my family's rules and regulations. Yeah. And my that's exactly what I said. See, you don't, you, I mean, it's like, a, it's, see, they, they coat a bitter pill with sugar. The sugar is the mainstream uh, packaging, the star, the whatever it is, right? Now, a lot of us take the sugar away, we like the sugar, but we don't really come away thinking about it. Like, do you go, like a lot of people will say, oh yes, that was a powerful movie, but powerful in what way? What they mean is, it's powerful in a cinematic way. But is it powerful in a way that, that changes the very way you think about things? Has it rattled your core and does it make you change a uh, thing? That, that's what I'm talking about. Shameful good is no way So that, that, what I'm saying is that, 
one second. I'm, I'm going to come back to the point. It's one of the things I want to talk about. You had something to say, ma'am? Yeah. yeah. I wouldn't say that actually because I think after the the compared to what we had as as you know in the as mainstream films in the 80s and 90s, I think uh, a lot of what we're getting today as mainstream is is fairly decent stuff, and I'm not I'm, you get the masala variety as well, but you also get a lot of other kinds of films. There are filmmakers who are seriously going and making. Now you may or may not like something like Bhag Milka Bhag as a film, but it as a what it tries to do and the way it tries to do it and the story that it tries to tell is not a masala story. It may have a flavor in it, but it's not your hero bashing up a villain kind of thing. You know, so I'm saying that all uh, the multiplexes have made possible a lot of different kinds of cinema. It's not that they don't exist. And that was a very successful film, Bhag Milka Bhag. So those films do exist. There's not no, no saying that. I'm talking about films with so that, that carry a social message potent enough that that message changes society. You, you want to? Yeah. Which they do, right? For instance, uh, 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 some of them, uh, like, uh, you, you can't, I mean, again, CSR, not everyone does it, right? But then, uh, when, you, when you're talking about films, there are some big production houses that make smaller movies possible, like, like this film uh, called Titli, which was released this year, was produced by Yashrat Studios. Uh, I don't know if it was produced by them or distributed by them, but it, one of the things happened. But they were, they were involved with it in, that, in a major way, which is why it got a fairly decent, uh, it didn't do well, but it was, a, uh, you know, it, it at least reached uh, theaters and was, it got, a, you know, it was there for people to see if they wanted to. So there's definitely, I mean, I don't know if they'd see it as CSR, but yes, promoting that kind of art, but it cannot be done at the, at the same kind of scale as uh, the other kind of film for purely economic reasons, so. Yeah, so that, that comes, I'm coming back to the point that somebody made here, saying that, uh, yeah. <laughs> you rightly said that the market dynamics and the customer's demand is what deciding the type of film. But, but my feeling is that after we gained independence and maybe some 10, 15 years, the middle class society of India has lost the big mission or vision of India and the idealism which was there till 1960s or 70s, maybe up to Nehru, is lost. That's what I was saying. The, the middle class and unfortunately we are taught not to excel really in all fields. We are taught to be happy what we have, you know. That's a typical of our Hindu religion. I would rather put it uh, to 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 be happy with what we have, unlike in Western civilization, where excellence has been in all strides of life, excellence has been put forward a major major area of idealism, and that's the major motivation behind. So so in this theory, essentially, the middle class and the upper class have lost the touch of how to bring in the next vision of India. They have lost. And the underprivileged and those who do not have, they are still just, uh, I mean, had, has not reached to the literacy level and they are living with a very shortcut entertainment. Right. That's where we are today. And to, ch to make this change happen, we need to bring a new vision of India, which perhaps uh, Dr. Kalam had brought vision 2020, vision 2050, with our Prime Minister Modi has uh, been talking. I mean, unless we have a new vision that replaces the vision of the... We had a vision of independent India. Right. You know, after that vision is gained, 
we need a new vision, maybe a developed India. So that theme is somewhere not there now. It is not there, which is what I've kind of broadly said that 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 from an idealism, uh, from a from an idealistic state, a lot of we're now in a very cynical state. So it's a, it's all about, you know, whether I'm okay, whether my family is okay, whether my son is studying in the U.S., whether that kind of stuff is happening, as opposed to a slightly more social, uh, you know, because unlike something like the Chennai floods happen, something calamitous happens you know, which, which, which forces us to look outwards. You know, most of us pretty much live in cocoons and say, you know, this is how it is and kind of things like that. But, so I just wanted to say, uh, address that one point that, uh, uh, that, that, you know, like, there, cinema is often blamed for the bad things that society uh, imbibes. Like, for instance, today, we, we, you know, we say that, you know, uh, Rajnikanth is smoking and therefore uh, you know, his fans take off smoking or they toss a cigarette like that or, or uh, somebody wears a certain kind of uh, uh, dress and, and that becomes popular or, or uh, you, know, um, uh, you know, so the thing is, so you even have disclaimers on, on, on about smoking and drinking and those kinds of things today. So uh, the censors then, uh, they take it upon themselves to, uh, to, to you know, snip out the sex scenes because that could be seen and, and uh, they think that that could create a bad, uh, you know, corrupt minds or whatever. And they, they, they censor swear words, uh, again, again with the thing that that could be, uh, you know, influential. But there has been no study done on whether uh, good things in cinema cause people to do good things. So we all seem to be in agreement that the bad, the so-called bad things in cinema are going to influence uh, society to act in a bad way, but no studies have been done about whether the if you show positive messages in cinema uh, and and are they are is it going to uh, cause society to uh, you know em, uh, embrace it in a positive way and act in a positive way? So I think that's that's something that people need to look at because if you are to look at cinema as an agent of social change, then you have to first see if the society is willing to or is capable of of uh, enacting that change if if you can if if you think that this can happen the bad stuff can happen can the good stuff happen too if you kind of uh, promote it through cinema now that's something that we need to look at before we say film should you know do these things. sorry yeah Right. In 80s, before 80s, we were shifting towards uh, uh, this all the uh, disco and all the things. That was the time when Shankara Varnam and other movies came, Sagar Sangha movies. And a study was made, it clearly showed that people were interested in dance and all people started sending children to dance. Okay. See that again. I'm telling you that that even in uh, Tamil cinema or in Hindi cinema, there were there were films that that spoke of certain uh, themes. You might have heard of filmmakers like uh, K. Balchandran and Bharti Raja and all those people. But again, we're talking about a time when a significant amount of people went to theaters to watch the movies because there was no other way to watch them, right? So directly or indirectly, some of it kind of uh, came back to them. Now, you, you, the, once that uh, avenue started shrinking and, and, and the kind of people who would watch those kinds of films just reduced or stayed at home, you know, you, those, that also went away. So if you, that's what I'm saying. It's also a supply and demand thing. If, if, if today all the people who watch movies at home say that we're going to watch these kinds of movies, like Amasan, for instance, if you're going to watch a movie, we're going to, uh, you know, uh, uh, thing, then, you know, they will make more movies like that. Uh, some film star's son becoming a, 
uh, trying to pick up. But uh, which field? I mean, like a doctor hands over his practice to his son. Uh, uh, was, which field don't you find this? But somehow in films, it becomes some special thing where it's mocked and, you know, that kind of uh, thing happens, right? It's, 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 so I'm saying that it's, it's a very visible medium and therefore uh, you're kind of... Uh, uh, thing happened, but yes, all, all, all the the points are kind of. Uh, Make it commercially viable. Why don't you reduce the cost of the cinema? Why hero directors are charged so much? Where if everybody is rated at least, including PM and president. Yeah. <laughs> How they can charge so much? How that's a question that you'll have to ask. <laughs> But, but that, that's a question all over the place, right? I mean, why is, uh, I don't know, why is uh, Tom Cruise making 100 million bucks per movie or whatever it is, you know, the, 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 why, why, why do those, uh, how, how can anyone justify that kind of amount of money? No, no, I'm talking about this is a worldwide phenomenon. It's not just a, just a thing. If you ask, if you, if you look at how much money Harrison Ford is making from the new uh, Star Wars movie, you just go dizzy because it's that, I mean, it's, it's insane that one movie should give one person this much money, but that's how it is. And it's not even that, it doesn't have that, kind of a, that much of a role in that film, you know. It's, uh, but that's how it is, it's, uh, you know. Yeah. But again, how, see, the thing is also that, that there are movies in, in other countries that talk about issues in, in see, the thing is, that the great advantage that other, other countries have that we don't have is that their mainstream movie uh, is, is not direct, uh, their mainstream uh, language is not, uh, is not uh, defined by, it's, it's a fairly clean thing, it's, it's not defined by things like songs and, and other, other kinds of things, you know. So uh, everyone watches a certain kind of movie. So uh, a, a, a film like Masan, for instance, which we consider as a certain kind of art film, would in, a, in, a, in an American market or a European market play like a normal film. I'm not talking all over America, but in certain pockets, and Europe, definitely in, in most of Europe, it would play like the average German film or your average Italian film or something like that. There's nothing that's so intimidating about it that people won't come and see. So it's also cinema watching culture of watch, of what, like for instance, if, if I took my mother to watch Masan, for instance, she might end up very bored because she's been brought up with a certain kind of filmmaking culture that, that, that with a kind of spoon feeding culture that, that kind of encourages a certain kind of thing. So, so it's also that, right? The kind of culture, the kind of language of cinema that is, we have a, a mainstream uh, cinema culture that, that for better or worse is, is, is completely different from every other kind of culture. So certain stories fit better in that than other kinds of, uh, uh, other, other kinds of uh, stories, so. Sure. Yeah. Do you want to? Uh, because I think I'm. I'm uh, we may need to wrap up. Okay. Yeah. So um, just a couple of points. One point is, while we've been do, talking do you want to about come no, I'm fine. Okay. Uh, would you like to come and sit? Uh, you can do it from here as well. Okay. If you'd like. Uh, so one point I wanted to make was that of regional cinema versus the mainstream Hindi cinema. So I think uh, you know this uh, discussion did come up of cultural sensitivities, right. but I do think that there may be pockets. And when I say pockets, I mean regional uh, cinema, where perhaps uh, one can look at this entire phenomenon slightly differently. And I'll give an example from Bengali film industry because I sort of know that a little better. So if today you ask an average man in the street, who are the good Bengali film directors, they will, I can assure you, they will name people who have not necessarily made commercially successful films but who've made films that have appealed to them and 
if you want to bring this divide, they, many of them are from the parallel cinema. So I think, while I agree that I mean it's impossible to cover this entire area, but I think we should be aware of certain amounts of cultural sensitivities that may take filmmaking in that culture or in that language in certain directions, which may be different from what we see in the large, the Bombay Hindi uh, mainstream cinema. That's, uh, That's definitely true, but again, if you're talking about people like Ray, for instance, uh, the, the, the fact is that Ray was, got into, he was very, very, he was a fantastic filmmaker, but he's also very lucky in the sense that he got into this international circuit at a very, very early stage. So he came with this, these laurels that kind of made him a curiosity, at least in the initial, when the most crucial stage of, of his, when somebody needs a push, right? Once you're established, that's fine. A Ray movie becomes an event. But you're talking about your, your first few films. So he came with that whole thing of, 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 with all this heraldry behind him. So I'm saying that that also might have played a part in, in the recognition that one gets. So which is why even today when you find filmmakers who are making these niche films with, with important issues, they usually try to do the, the, the festival road first. They go there, they get, the, you know, they, they, they play uh, in, in these festivals, they get that kind of uh, recognition, and then they come here and show the films with that backing. So people have that extra added incentive to go watch the film. But again, what I'm saying is, is that the people who go watch these films are mostly people who are converts to, these co to the cause. The, the, when you're talking social change, you want people who need to be changed. If I, I mean, I don't want to put myself on a moral pedestal and say I don't need to be changed. But if, if, if what I'm saying is, you, you need. If you're talking about uh, a feudal, uh, a movie with a feudal theme and that talks about the, the the horrors of the feudal system, you need people who are uh, victims of that system or perpetrators of that system to watch that film. And most of them are not in the cities. Most of them are the villages, where these films never uh, today, which never, which are never screened because there are no multiplexes in those places. So you're talking about uh, uh, films that talk about issues which are being made, but are being shown to people who are who are not going to change anything because they already believe that that's wrong. That's where I was coming from. Yeah. Uh, the other point I yeah. wanted to make was, you know, and again I'll draw on my personal experience. If you ask my father when he was uh, making films, do you make art films or do you make commercial yeah. films? He said there are good films and there are, and there are bad yeah. films. So I think his was a good example where I think every film of his had a social message, often disguised, but it's, it's lives of the people on screen playing out lives, and most of them were commercial successes. So I think to him, and I think this is an important point, is that while the filmmaker has to be concerned about the finances, because you know he's making the film for someone else, and there has to be profits, but it's also possible to make a film where you can put in a message, maybe subtly, and if you make a good film, and I think he will raise the same point, that people will come to them. So it's not necessary that we should always look upon it, historically at least it has not been so, that a parallel film, a parallel or art film will never make money, and a commercial film will always make money. No, no, I was never... carry a message. I no. was not saying that. And the other thing is, I was uh, the, the, I agree completely that the distinction between an art and commercial film is a... It's a loose one, but sometimes it's useful to denote a certain kind of film or of a certain kind of uh, 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 path a film takes from filmmaker to audience. That's pretty much it. But where, what I'm saying is, uh, the parallel films... Ard Satya was a blockbuster for its, uh, exactly. this kind of thing. It was not just sure. a hit, it was a blockbuster. Sure. It was like making money like an Amitabh movie for a few weeks, you know. So you're talking about, so it's not, not that these films do not, but what happens is, I was talking about from the perspective of social change. When you have these films playing only in pockets where, uh, simply because of distribution issues, when you have these films playing only in pockets where you're already preaching to the converted, then, then there is no... Then what are you... I mean, Absolutely. that's I what, that's really what that's I'm trying to say. Yeah. yeah. So that part of the audience are responsible for whatever is the uh, state of affairs today. People have stopped going to the movie theaters for whatever be the reason. And the people read it, the audience target will put it back. So they started making movies on a magnum opus, trying to bring certain things which would make them certain... <coughs> 
one film movie theater to watch. Maybe three and few others. Cinema school and uh, making on a high budget, adding more and more of uh, commercial items so that audience would come. And today we see the life of the movies. We don't see any movies uh, going for 100 days. Yeah. That's one long time. So I need to make money uh, within the shortest span of time. Maybe within that one week or two weeks. After that, another movie is going to come. So I don't see where I can make money, where I can get back my uh, investment. So that's why... Uh, so there, are, there is a slight thing, right? Because it's, it's, it's also that there are some who come and say, I want to make tons of money. But there are also those, like his father, for instance, who are like, I'm going to invest X amount of money. And if I get, let's say, a little bit more than that, and if, I'm, if my distribution is secure, I'm fine with that. So it also depends on the type of filmmaker you're, you're kind of talking about. Because there, are, there, are, there have been many, many filmmakers who can, be, who can be called successful filmmakers simply because they have a long body of work. And they have uh, uh, what is called a successful body of work, even if not many people have heard of them, simply because they, they've never made films that lost money. And, their films have, and they've continued to kind of uh, make money. So th that's possible. But again, what you're talking about is there are all kinds of uh, things, right? Like, uh, like if a person invests 100 crores in a movie, then he is going to have to make a very broad movie because you know you 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 you're you're already it's like uh, you know it's you know what I'm saying it's it's a very uh, I have put one uh, I have put one uh, suggestion I, since you are into movie how to reduce cost and all that uh, we can take a parallel from uh, this Google and all that they uh, they their model is to give free and then through advertisement they take it. Why not make a uh, movie which will run some scroll, something, something, uh, some message, wow. and it will go to, it will <laughs> go, and then if anybody wants to see without scroll, then he will go to. But that's already happening in forms of product placements and things like that, right? Even your James Bond movie, which is like guaranteed to become a blockbuster worldwide, they take uh, so much money from your car companies and your other companies, right, to uh, place. What I mean? They just uh, put their car into scenes and all. Now, what I mean to say is that uh, they can make two versions of uh, movie. One to in a big uh, uh, this thing uh, multiplex and all that. One in the smaller low budget uh, there. Low budget will have scroll. The other one will have. See, if I have more money, I You're go. You're talking there. about two versions of the same movie. <laughs> <laughs> And all that, everybody, everything is now with the, the fiber and all that. So we, uh, you can, uh, you have uh, the same movie paying uh, thousand bucks here. Uh, same movie can be seen by paying uh, two hundred bucks. One minute. You have to respond to Miss about your two questions that you said. You yes, uh, your two questions. Uh, I was I'm going. Sorry, to... We'll just come back to you. No, yours, yours, uh, Miss Sanya. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, I yeah. almost forgot my question, yeah. but the first one was... One was about music, I think. Yes, uh, yeah. one was because about... I, I, the only reason I said that is because it didn't seem relevant to what you were discussing, yeah, yeah. so I just I, thought we'd I, talk about it. Yeah. That is yeah. why I yeah. posed it as a question yeah. that you could take later. Yeah. It was about why mu music is so intrinsic to uh, Indian cinema when you compare it uh, with other cinema, uh, world cinema, or even uh, other uh, countries, uh, even in parallel versus the <coughs> mainstream uh, entertaining movies. That was one. And the second one, I think that... But I, it got answered. The gap merging between parallel and the mainstream nowadays uh, more than it was when uh, it was boxed up as parallel cinema. We spoke about that. Yes. Yeah. So about the music thing, it's again a cultural thing. It's uh, any any mainstream cinema uh, around the world is driven a lot by music, and they tend to think that. If it's a sad scene, we need some sad music. If it's a happy scene, we need some happy music. Because, uh, like for instance, um, one thing that, like some people make the mistake of assuming that just because we see uh, the Cannes and Berlin Film Festival type of French and Italian films, we make the mistake of assuming that all French films are like that and all German films are like that and all, they are not. That is a certain kind of, they are the Masan kind of French film, the Masan kind of, Italian films, the average French films that become blockbusters are very broad films, comedies and other kinds of films. So if you look at those films, 
they are also driven very strongly by music cues and other kind of cues which kind of hit the audience on the head and say uh, you know this is what it is so it's a it's a it's a mainstream filmmaking uh, device or tactic that's, that's all there is to it so that's i think we have time for just a couple of quick questions please uh, this sir uh, so you're talking about social change uh, movie and social change uh, talking about bollywood cinema it is understood that at certain level certain time it was dominated by the underworld industry. By the? Of, by the underworld. Under, yeah. Maybe for finance and something, which portrayed the lawmaking agencies, especially customs, police, in a very bad way. It did cause a social change. So has any, uh, like, uh, what, do you, what is your suggestion? What is your view about this? Well, I don't know if that's a change so much as a perception, right? See, I, I would say one change that has happened in films over the years, in mainstream films especially, is that uh, we have begun to see uh, more independent women who are not just, uh, you know, there to dance with a hero. I'm, those women, I mean, those heroines are still there, but we find, uh, you know, heroines, uh, like it is possible today to make, uh, like, you know, after the Nutan films of the 60s, for instance, for a very, very long time, you rarely found a heroine-centric movie. But today, you're finding the odd, I'm not saying that they're everywhere, but you're still finding the odd Kahani coming up, you're still finding a Mardani coming up, you're still finding a, you know, a, a dirty picture or whatever it is. So, you know, those kinds of things show something because I, I, I'm not saying that people are coming to see, oh, it's a heroine-centric film, I should go watch it. No, they're still going to watch what they think is going to be an entertaining film or something like that. But it's become possible to, to kind of market a film like that. So I think that those things are also changes that have happened over the years. And again, you know, if filmmakers did not take these risks, those changes would not have happened. So those are also changes, no? That's... Uh... Yeah, yeah, that much alarming, um, that mainstream cinema is uh, not deviated that much, I can say. Shankar, um, Maniratnam, Rajamoli, you, you can see some statistical analysis. Um, all blockbusters movie carry theme. In Some theme message will be there, definitely. In the two and a half hours, if you see that uh, 120 plus uh, 31, if you remove some 20, 15 to 20 minutes, uh, the remaining will be the main uh, center point for its success. Now, if you see, um, mean because uh, generally I will regularly see the review of Hindu, uh, I can say Hindu review with 99% confidence you can go for movie. Oh God. That is because generally, uh, uh, generally this is what, uh, because I am a regular uh, reader of Hindu, uh -huh. I am talking about it. any movie just before uh, making a decision, of course, I have, uh, Times of India and other things you read, but uh, with 99% or 95% maybe various, uh, you can go confidently to that movie, but don't expect miracles from the movie because already many messages are known to the people. Uh, so only if you remove that 15 minutes, that 5 minutes item song, 10 minutes fighting if you remove, the rest of the movie decides the success. You see, so th that message will be there, that message is people are taking the message, it is not that people are not taking, suppose say, uh, take Shankar's Robo, Robo, Robo movie, uh, how much impact it has made, uh, highly technical content is there in that movie. Um, you, you, they, uh, he taught us how to dismantle an item, you, you, you just you cannot throw, like the technical contents are there and similarly Maniratna movie Bombay, you can see Bombay. So uh, it is not that we have deviated from the mainstream, still movies are doing its purpose in social responsibility. Wise. No, I am saying that there is a difference between a movie being social responsible and that translating a viewer going and seeing it as a movie versus a viewer going and seeing it as something and getting impacted by it and, and, and following it in his life. So I'm talking about, see the topic is social change. It is happening, so, it is happening because you see corruption has reduced after Shankar movie is seeing that Bharati you do. Oh wow. Is there are movies. Okay. Yeah, you see, I mean, you see, we cannot expect overnight results, you see, we cannot expect overnight results. Slowly, the positive message takes longer time, negative may spread faster, but similarly. So one small uh, last question, sir. Any chances of reaching Oscar, sir, by Indian cinema? Who is this? Oh, I, I have no idea. This is <laughs> sir, one, one question about your profession. I'm very curious about the film critic profession because it's a, I think, a handful of you. 
and uh, how is it that the money flows in this uh, profession and how do you get acclaim it's like a doctor and how do you how <laughs> money flows i mean like what means, is this means, uh, I, i wish money flowed <laughs> this yes. is, uh, we are journalists like anybody else yeah? so we, it's like uh, uh, just like there are people in the political beat there are people on the sports beat there are people on the uh, business beat we are on the film beat so it's it's uh, you know it's not the money aspect comes from your news your paid your paid Who employee you of the paper and uh, you know uh, uh, so that that's where your your money comes from so i get paid yes i hope so yeah. <laughs> yeah. i'll just like to ask you uh, one little question you I'm mean not, yeah yeah you've seen the audience you've got a pulse of what the indian audience is like urban and rural and semi urban you've got an idea of what technology we have in the film industry what we can make do you think we can make a movie like et or interstellar or star wars or born free in india with indian characters which has no theme based on any social cause but a very entertaining 3 hours for the for a average family or a group of people but that's yeah we we are capable of making that kind of movie it's we have uh, made such we have made films. we have made films no i'm like not talking about like robo and you know those type of thing may they may be very regional and very hero people hero worship that actor so they're ready to see him in any domain right. but pan india no like i would say even a film like bahubali for instance is a is a fictional myth superhero kind of film so what your what the us is making as uh, iron man and uh, whatever it is this is a very localized version of that same kind of myth so i don't see a uh see th- see one thing that that if you analyze the mainstream industries and many uh, thing and you talk about a narrative the way they tell the stories may be different like some some you know we'll have songs they won't have songs things like that but to a large extent if you look at the the hero's journey you know things like how this character comes in and things like that uh those you will find a lot of parallels in many industries it's not like some very you know special thing that right i think uh we must bring this to a close and uh, clearly i think the first two points that you made that it is a, a medium cinema is a medium which reaches out to everyone and that was very clear from the kind of discussions and the involvement that all of us felt right. in your talk uh, and the second thing is it is a very powerful medium right. so even you know one experience of sitting for a couple of hours in a hall and you come back you are somewhere you change whether that is social change whether you change your attitude towards your family members or not sometimes can't be quantified but i think there is a tremendous amount of influence that we have so uh, i just wanted to now call on dr archana sharma to deliver a vote of thanks so yeah, in this uh, 30th niyas program for senior executive it is my privilege to propose vote of thanks so respected chairman i behalf of uh, this all my fraternity and my own behalf i thank the speaker dr uh, rangan for being with us besides having his busy schedule he could make and come on time and i also want to thank for his uh, excellent coverage on the cinema and social changes and his analysis his theory why it is uh, not possible to make uh, a parallel cinema as good as a commercial cinema I but i personally i like the discussion personally i like the interaction and discussion between chairman and the speaker during the <laughs> talk yeah. thank you so much sir thank you thank you <laughs> just to add one thing i hope nothing that i said came off as cast an iron things right because what one thing that i believe in is that these are all large large topics that that are very impossible to encapsulate within a one hour session which is one of the reasons i like these interactions because uh, it you know i i believe that if if at least few points here kind of either change the way you think about these issues or or make you think more about these issues that's really what the point is rather than me giving you cold truths about all these things that's not the intention at all so if you feel that something that i said is you know what i don't really quite agree with what he said that's fantastic because then you're going to start thinking about it in different ways so that's really what this is about not you know theories so it was yeah. quite thought provoking thank you that thank that's you. really that yeah thanks